Hello and salam. Welcome to MacFest 2021. Wherever you are, in the UK or around the world. Today, I'm delighted to introduce our host, Jonathan Davidson. Jonathan is a poet, a writer, and a literature activist. He lives in the English Midlands, but works internationally. His poetry has been widely published, and he has also written memoir and criticism. His radio dramas and adaptations have been broadcast by BBC radios three and four. Much of his work is focused on how writing, especially poetry, is experienced by readers and listeners alike. He is the director of the project management company Midland Creative Projects Limited, joint founder of the, Brit of the Birmingham Literature Festival, and founder and chief executive of Writing West Midlands. He is also the chair of the National Association of Writers in Education. So Jonathan, over to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Suleiman, for that lovely introduction. Uh, yes, welcome to this event as part of the Muslim Arts and Culture Festival. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and I'm delighted to have uh, four fascinating British Muslim creatives who will be talking about their work and the experiences they've had developing their work. Um, before we introduce our four guests, I'm going to introduce you to Russell, our sign language interpreter, and he'll be interpreting on behalf of Rabia Hussein. Russell, welcome to our event. Thank you very much. Lovely. So when we have questions uh, uh, for and answers from Rabia, Russell will be interpreting and he will be doing his best to interpret all, all of our conversations. So I certainly will be trying to speak clearly, which I don't always do. So now to our distinguished guests. Uh, I'll be welcoming everybody uh, briefly. Uh, some of our guests have uh, some things to show us on the screen. And then once we've gone through that process, we'll be having some questions and conversation. Um, and there will be an opportunity for people to ask questions via the Q&A uh, facility on your screens. So our first guest is Rabia Hussein. Rabia is an independent filmmaker who has worked on numerous mainstream documentaries and projects with an internationally well-known broadcaster. For the last two years, she has worked for ITV in a variety of roles, including directing, producing documentaries, and has worked on programmes including Mission Employable. Rabia, welcome to our event. Hello, and thank you very much. Now, I know later, Rabia, we're going to see a short clip of your work, but for the moment, I'll move on and um, welcome our, our second guest. Our second guest is Samir Malik. Samir is an artist, a calligrapher, designer and photographer. He has worked with international corporations, royalty, galleries, schools and individuals worldwide. He is acknowledged as one of the pioneers of the current revival and reinvention of Islamic calligraphy in the West. His work has been exhibited internationally and his art, designs and photography have been featured in periodicals and books, along with frequent appearances on television. His art is part of the national UK national curriculum and is held in private collections across the globe. Uh, Samir, welcome. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honour and a pleasure to be here with this great team of creatives. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And as I mentioned, we will be seeing a, a brief snapshot of some of your work when you come on to talk about your, your practice in more detail. Now, yes, I'm going yes. to be, uh, I should also mention that uh, Samir is running a workshop as part of the festival. So uh, having been inspired by his work, as I'm sure you will be, if you'd like to take part in the workshop, please look at the festival website and you can find details about how to book. Now we come to our third uh, guest and I'm delighted to welcome Teekster. Teekster is an international award-winning artist. He offers a fresh contemporary take on Islamic art for the 21st century. His work is featured in many publications and exhibitions across the USA, the UAE, Europe and the Far East over the last 10 years. And he has uh, global audiences which have included members of Middle Eastern royalty and many other people besides. Teekster, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. It's an um, honour to be standing next to all virtually standing next to a bunch of honoured and amazing, talented people um, across the board. But yeah, thank you. Lovely. And uh, we will be uh, seeing a little snapshot of your work as well a bit later, I understand. Yes, indeed. Good. Um, uh, Teekster is also running a workshop as part of the festival. 
Um, so we look forward to, uh, to you signing up for that by going to the festival website. We do have a fourth guest, uh, um, but I don't believe she's yet on the call. Uh, one of the challenges of working uh, on the internet is sometimes people get stuck in hyperspace. Uh, so we hope that she will appear on our screen shortly. And at that point, I will introduce Dr. Miriam. Hey, Miriam Paul. is with us. Um, yeah, I'm I, I am here. <laughs> oh, you are there. Okay. And now the reason I can't see you is I have uh, too many images on my screen. Uh, no so worries. Screen two. There you are. Yes. yes. Hello. 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 Thank you. Very nice <laughs> right. to see you. Uh, nice so I, you. I'm going to say a few things about you. So you are uh, I'm worried. a journalist, a writer, yes. a broadcaster an academic working on issues relating to Islam, France and the Middle East. Uh, and your writing is featured widely in British press, including The Guardian and The New Statesman, and also on CNN Online and Middle East and I. And in 2019, uh, you set up the website, We Need to Talk About Whiteness, to open up a conversations in the UK about white racial identity and its impact. Uh, Miriam, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Lovely. So uh, before we, um, before I ask our guests to say a bit about their work one by one, um, uh, to remind you again that you can drop your questions into the Q&A section on the website. If you scroll to the bottom of your screen, you should see the Q&A button. Um, we'd soon you put the questions in the Q&A section rather than in the chat section because there are a limited number of screens that I can keep an eye on at the same time. But we will get your questions one way or the other. So towards the end of our session, I'll be reading out some of your questions and inviting our guests to answer them. Um, First of all, um, I am going to um, I am going to ask our first uh, uh, guest to say a bit more about her work. So uh, we're going to go to Rabia Hussein. Uh, you've heard me say a little bit about uh, what she has done, but now it's an opportunity for her to tell us a bit about her work and also, I believe, to show us a very short screen roll. First of all, I'd like to begin with thanking uh, you for uh, inviting me here and giving me this opportunity. Uh, I have a lot of experiences and I've come across a lot of challenges with uh, being deaf, being a, a female Asian within the, the Muslim community. It's very rare to see somebody uh, of my colour in this position in the mainstream world, let's say. So this is a, a wonderful opportunity for me to share my work with you. I'm very passionate uh, about what I create. I hope it has uh, an impact and a, a very deep meaning to the, the, the global community and also the deaf community uh, at that as well. I think it's important for people to see how the deaf community is changing in a positive way and how uh, a female uh, person is working within the mainstream uh, media world as well. I want to show you my showreel and then I will explain briefly a little bit more about the challenges and about my own personal experience. Thank you very much. That would be great. Those were a variety of clips uh, of different countries that I've actually been around the world, working with local communities, uh, campaigning for better education, deaf rights uh, within the deaf community. We wanted, uh, within those clips, I wanted to show what the deaf community is like uh, across the globe and what real life is like across the globe, not a polished image of that. I'm passionate uh, about fighting for uh, better deaf education, equality for deaf uh, communities. And by doing that, uh, by putting myself forward as a positive role model, showing the right attitude to those communities to show that it can be done uh, rather than it can't be done. 
and you know they're documentary based uh, images and I think it was important to show that. I've traveled uh, extensively to many of countries to make some short films and documentaries for different broadcasters and I for me, it's important to show that deaf people as individuals, as professionals, can do exactly the same as the wider population. I can do it, and I like to show people that we can all do it, the same as what you can do it. Lovely, thank you very much. And uh, having read on your CV, uh, you certainly can do an enormous amount. Your, your, your accomplishments are... Uh, in relatively few years are really impressive and, and I'm going to be asking you some more questions once I've introduced everybody else about your practice and how you've managed to um, make this wonderful work available to us. Uh, and as Russell was saying, we will be sharing the showreel uh, on the website of the festival so you'll be able to watch it with, with the addition of the soundtrack as well. Um, so thank you very much to our first guest. I now move on to uh, Samir. Um, so Samir, I imagine uh, the life of a calligrapher uh, has uh, a range of slightly different challenges in terms of how you work with people and how you engage with the work um, and how your, your heritage and faith connects with that. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your work and possibly show us some examples of your work? Sure, I'd be honoured to. Um, uh, I'm not sure if there's much difference because it's, I think from seeing Rabia's work, it's she's She's doing what she loves doing, and that's what I, I, I'm doing with my calligraphy. I was actually banned from being a calligrapher when I was a child by my father, who wanted me to have a, a normal profession. So I studied medicine, practiced for 10 years, and after 10 years, I gave it up. I went to Damascus to find myself and ended up studying classical Arabic calligraphy there 20 years ago. And um, from a first lesson, I realized this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I've been doing it ever since. And I love it. It's the most amazing profession. I'm so blessed to do what I do. And the challenges that it's brought are manifold. I've, I've, I've had to grow as a human being, as a, as a calligrapher, as an artist. Uh, I've had to learn about patience with myself, about making mistakes powerfully, about um, carrying things through. You know, something I, I couldn't do very often as a child to just i give up stuff, I'll start great projects and then hmm. suddenly find something more exciting or shinier to, to, to latch on to. And um, it's, been, it's been a real, real, real kind of great journey. I'm going to just share some, some of my art so people can see. Yes, please um, do. Yes, so let's see. So just bear with me a second as I... There we are. Okay. So this is um, what I started... Okay, can you all see that? Yeah. So I trained classical Arabic calligraphy. That's actually a photo of me in, in uh, Jerusalem last year. And when I started, I wanted to create something that was just different. My teacher asked me at the end of the course, what do I want to do? And I, want, I said, I want to change calligraphy in the world forever. So I didn't know how to do that or how, you know, how it's going to look like, but I just played with it, explored it and developed it. And over years, using classical tools, I've, you know, I've, Played with shape, played with form, played with color. That says uh, Hua or Yehovah. On the right, it says Salam. And okay, so just using classical tools, using inks, using paint, I learned to play with colors and explore. I hated in the beginning working with digital work. Um, I, I like the, the old fashioned way. So it took me a long, long time. And you can see there, for, exa for example, it says Allah on the left, and al Malik, one of the names of God, the Lord, the King, on the right. So just playing, exploring. Then I moved on to canvases. So I worked a lot with canvas. And just want to, what I realized, the most difficult thing about my art was having it be really authentic, a, a, an authentic self-expression of who I really am and my journey. And I realized along, along the way that needs a lot of bravery to show who you are because there's a risk that somebody will turn around and say, well, that's not very good, is it? And um, so I, I carried on. I had great, great teachers, great, great mentors. I ended up working in, in, in mosques. So I, I did calligraphies for mosques. And then I branched into digital, working with digital. But digital was using photographs, calligraphies, scans, and playing with colors. 
you can see there, I also explore the different languages. That's in Hebrew, in G Greek, and in, in Arabic, the, the word light. Used, uh, yeah, my work was used in film, show reels, uh, and then just carried on exploring, exploring with colors, exploring with form, trying to see what I could create. And what I realized was that, yeah, branching out into designing fabrics, book covers, for example, cards that says welcome to Liverpool on the left hand side. Uh, what I love most of all is actually teaching. So I, before COVID hit, I used to teach a lot uh, in different schools, colleges, private institutions. And that's the, for me the most amazing thing is to actually be teaching, exploring. So I get very inspired by, by the students, but also I get to see how, um, how yeah, I have kind of a legacy that goes. There's a legacy that that uh, part of me will live on in the world after I'm I'm yeah buried, long gone. And so challenges have been yeah many fold, but it's been a great great journey so far. I'm so excited about what's coming next. Uh, with the COVID, with everything that's hit, I've realised I have to reinvent who I am, but try and stay authentic, true to my vision, my heart and how I want to express myself in the world. And I, it, it, it's great. It's like, I, I've got no idea how that works. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. So I'm going to learn something and, you know, explore and the world will be new again, inshallah. Thank you. Uh, well, that's a wonderfully eloquent uh, description of your practice. And uh, thank you for showing us those images. They, they went by all too quickly. Uh, I do know you have a website and people can yes. look at your work in more detail on the website. Uh, I'm very interested in what you said about the challenges of changing yourself, learning how to adapt to your practice, but also your desire to change the world as well. And it seems that those two impulses are different ends of a spectrum, perhaps, uh, changing yeah, how true. we are as individuals and then trying to change the world collectively. So we may well come back to that with, with our other speakers as well. That may be a question I'll ask people. Thank you very much, Samir. Um, Thank we'll you. be speaking Thank with you uh, momentarily. So I now come to our, our third uh, Creative British Muslim, uh, Tikhsta, who is um, a visual artist, as you know. Um, Tikhsta, uh, I'm not sure if we are going to be able to share any of your images because of the challenges of the internet and the world shortage of broadband. But if you'd like to tell us a bit about your practice and how you've developed as an artist and what kind of things have, have uh, caused you to develop in that way. Sure, I'm going to try to share my screen, but I kind of feel ashamed now because I think my work is a shadow compared to Samia's work. Um, I think you got a right masterclass there, but alas, I'll, I'll proceed anyway um, okay. and share my work. But let me know if the moment my screen has appeared. Lovely, yes. Okay, brilliant. So this is just going to be more of a taster for what I'm going to be doing during my workshop. So I'm just going to glaze over some of the work that I've done over the years. Um, like Samia, I, I, I started from a more digital kind of like approach rather than traditional, maybe because I had more access to, the, to that particular type of technology. I'm not saying that the traditional methods are any less, it's just that that was what I started to begin with. So as usual, calligraphy being the pinnacle point of Islamic art, I've spent a lot of time dabbing around with calligraphy. I think this, uh, using different type of colours and techniques. Um, because I'm a child of two different worlds, I kind of, because I have my British upbringing, and then I've got my Islamic heritage. I wanted to fuse both of those to create something new. I guess at the time, the digital artwork, which I saw on the internet was basically flat and it had it evolved. So then I kind of thought, well, what's my own personal spin on it? What would I like to see? So this is with me playing with like the typography element or the calligraphy element. Then um, I think, it's kind of strange when you when you live in two different worlds. In the West, the figure is kind of like considered the pinnacle point of art, while in the East, it's words. Um, and especially if you have Je uh, Japanese calligraphers from China and Japan and the Middle Eastern world, words were kind of like the peak. So then I kind of thought, well, if that 
if the visual image or the figure image was kind of like the peak in the Western world, how could Islamic art, if you if I stated the core values, what could I use to symbolize, you know, Islamic art using the figure type of them? In my workshop, I'll probably delve more into this and the creation behind these kind of like um, uh, designs and the thought processes behind it. But for now, we can just have a quick glaze of the type of things that I've done using like particular um, people and settings to care to, to basically get a feel of what uh, a visual kind of presence or a spiritual presence that a person can have when viewing my work. So from then I kind of um, wanted to explore, you know, with, with calligraphy, how, which areas could you push it into? How could you, you know, using the latest technology add new effects to it? Uh, and basically push the barrier and I think that's one of the core things in my work is pushing things um, with you know the latest technologies rather than being stale um, and but keeping it true Islamic art to its true core values of basically the spiritual and the kind of like the divine presence then I also dabbled with um, um, pseudo calligraphy where it's less focused on the words, but more focused on the letters and kind of like reinterpreting it, what, you know, um, using calligraphy as more as a line element. But even in the Islamic world, even the words or the Arabic letters, each individual letters have its own supreme meaning, which, you know, if, you, if you're an art historian, you can delve in to learn more. And so from then, I kind of use those kind of practices and use art into to beautify locations. So basically creating murals, which I'm also known for. So it's designing uh, bespoke pieces for walls or for offices or children play areas to actually um, posters in the streets. So one thing I don't, I don't like is basically seeing adverts everywhere where they kind of like, um, basically devalue the value of human kind of like presence and kind of like objectifying people. So basically putting art in basically advert places, working with people like Adblock Bristol and Adblock Birmingham um, to beautify those locations. And basically another project is basically using geometry to basically revitalize abandoned areas because um, a recent study has shown that with kind of like Muruk, people care about places. And if you beautify those places, then they have a slight connection to them. And basically the, the kind of like social, negative social impact decreases within those areas um, once you put murals inside those areas. So that was basically a quick kind of like whistle stop tour of the type of stuff that I've been doing over the past few years. Um, but yeah, um, we can delve more into that yeah. later during the course of um, this um, talk. Lovely. Well, thank you again so much for those images. They were really striking. And I'm very taken with two of the things you've just said. Firstly, replacing adverts with art has surely to be a good thing. Um, just that one screenshot you have there of the, the, the mural uh, in front of all of the advertising communicated that. Uh, and also um, the notion that if we use art to beautify our built environment, we will respond more positively to living there, which has Great. got to be yeah. an obvious thing. And um, it's interesting, but of course, the, the world likes to perceive artists as being um, out of the world and, and not concerned with the practicalities of day-to-day -day life, but actually your visual art can very directly influence how happy people feel when they move through a space, which is, which is surely a good thing. Um, so thank you for that. We will come back no and problem. have some more conversations about your work, but I will now just, um, introduce our final speaker. Um, we've already had a brief welcome from Miriam. Um, Miriam, would you like to uh, say a bit about uh, your work and how your career has developed? I know it has moved initially from the moving image and now more towards the word, so maybe there's something you can say about It's actually that the exact opposite of that, <laughs> Jonathan, oh, okay. but don't worry about it. Um, what I was going to say is, look, I also have a show reel, but I don't know if um, it's the best use of everyone's limited time for us to uh, watch my show reel. So instead, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pop it in the chat and anyone who does want to have a look at my show reel is more than welcome to do so. And you can get in touch with me if you have any questions that's popped in there. 
I think maybe um, a better use of my time would be to discuss how I, so creativity isn't necessarily always associated with journalism. And we've heard from artists who, as you say, you know, kind of considered the sort of purists when it comes to um, this sphere. Um, I can't speak for all journalists, but for me, I've always seen my work as a journalist as deeply creative. I see my job as being one in which I take very real important world issues and I try and find um, the most the, the best way to connect those issues to people's hearts um, and I like to think that all artists ultimately are trying to speak to people's hearts um, and the key is what's the best medium that you have at your disposal to communicate that particular message to people's hearts and that's why I've actually um, evolved between different fields um, of journalism. I began uh, in print. I still consider myself a writer. I still write. Uh, but then I went into uh, news reporting um, and then uh, mainly documentaries these days uh, and writing. Um, and the reason for that is pretty much down to uh, the issue that I just mentioned, which was with time, I came to the conclusion that uh, words in and of themselves or alone, um, typically, um, firstly, we're, we're in a culture where a lot of people don't read, right? We need to face the facts. It's for me very sad as somebody who loves books, but the reality is a lot of people don't read. Um, m many more people are looking at screens. And so if you wanna communicate to people en masse, you need to speak the language of the people and the language of the people today is largely a visual one uh, and uh, unfortunately for many of us who enjoy long form uh, a, a short uh, concentration span visual one uh, and so for me that's where documentary uh, filmmaking and I, I've made films that are 15 minutes I've made films that are like an hour long I'm working on a 90 minute at the moment so um, it's all kind of dependent on what you think is going to be the best vehicle uh, for you to be able to speak to people's hearts and for me the the key thing with any artistic form is that you can say all the right things but unless you're able to speak to what's inside people if you unless you're able to connect with them at a deeply human level which is far more than the cerebral then you are debating and I don't debate. I don't, I'm not interested in arguing with people. I'm interested in sharing human perspectives. I'm interested in sharing, you know, truths, if you want to call it that. Um, and in that sense, it's, it's kind of like an offering that you put out into the world. And I'm sure the purists, or I'd like to think the, pur the purists will relate to that idea is all you can ever do is channel something that is uh, from somewhere deep inside of you. Uh, into something that you hope will be received in its purest form uh, and in that sense will be able to communicate and affect change. I guess ultimately that's where for me uh, in everything I do I'm always hoping that uh, the reception of that piece of work will lead to some kind of positive change in the world, small or large. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much there. And, and I apologise for getting the trajectory of your career exactly no the right, way around. No worries but, uh, at all. Yeah, no worries. Uh, um, but very interesting here, you also talk about the importance of, of connecting to individuals and of facilitating some change beyond yourself, change in, in other people and in, in communities. And I think we'll probably come back to that. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask each of our, our panellists a particular question to allow them to extend a bit more what they want to say about their work. And then we will have chance for questions from the audience, from the chat room. I notice we've got 42 comments already, so I'll be scrolling through that shortly to pick out some questions for everyone. But let me start by asking a question uh, for Rabia. Um, so your most recent films have focused on the experience of the deaf community. Um, and you said in your introduction, but that was something clearly you were very, felt was very important. Um, I, when reading about your work, was in awe of how you have faced the challenges of just simply making these pieces, um, working with that particular community, given the, the oppression it potentially faces. Would you say a little bit about the process you've used in order to allow those people to speak and the ideas to be heard? Thank you, Jonathan. In one of my projects, it was difficult. Um, one of the most difficult ones that I'd actually done, one of the biggest challenges I'd ever faced. It's a sensitive topic and we have to remember that. 
And we also have to be respectful of people's perspective on the world. So I brought as much empathy, empathy as I could bring to it, giving people the opportunity, you know, because I'm exposing their culture and I, I was very conscious of that. And obviously it's, you know, you, you base it on the knowledge you have, you do your research, you do your planning. I actually went to Kenya to do a piece of this work. So it was important for me to get the information accurate. It, you know, I'm, I'm representing a topic um, and, you know, the biggest issue in, in Kenya in terms of disability is they're seen as a, a lower communi community. They don't take part in the community. It's underfunded. There's a lot of reasons uh, why, it is being, why it is set up there. And I wanted to look at that and show why it was like that to other people, to give people a better understanding. So networking was important. Uh, you know, introducing myself as Rabia, you know, explaining where I'm from. So sharing my experiences, uh, allowing people time to ask those questions to me. And if they wanted to share their own background, I, I was there to, 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 to facilitate that. A slow process, uh, baby steps, I would call it. Uh, and it took months and months and months. And slowly and slowly, I started to understand what they were trying to tell me. And then I built on the story and then I got, luckily, I got connections with other people because people felt safe telling me their stories. And then I networked very, very quickly um, within, within that community. And I was able to tell their story by them sharing their stories and just believing in what they were telling, you know, being honest with them talking about my own experiences, giving them the opportunity and telling them that, you know, we can share your story with the rest of the world. Let, allowing them to, to speak personally. And it was lovely to see. It was, it was amazing to actually see. It had a massive impact on myself. I felt completely immersed within the community. It's, it's actually hard to put into words, um, but it was just one of those experiences that uh, I'm in awe of. You know, it was a challenge. Emotionally, it was a challenge. You know, I'm a deaf person myself. You know, over there, you're seen as disabled. Uh, and, you know, I, I remember the struggles I'd gone through as a child in this country. But at the same time, I didn't allow that to mould me, if that makes sense. So I felt I'd broken through from those challenges and that created me into the person I am now. I'm a great believer that, you know, you can do anything that you put your mind to. I was lucky enough to work with uh, VSO overseas. Um, I went to London initially, you know, started all my networking there. And, you know, they're using the film actually uh, to, you know, to broadcast across the globe. And I feel very, very proud of that piece of work that I've done. I think it's an opportunity to tell a story, uh, people telling their own stories uh, you know, and hopefully it's brought some funds into their, their community to, to, you know, enhance their lives. And it's been a wonderful experience for me. Th thank you very much. That, this sounds like a really important piece of work. And, and I would urge people to, to find a way of watching it and to go onto your website and find out more about what, what you're doing. I wonder if you would mind me asking whether your, your uh, Muslim faith, your upbringing, your culture uh, has particularly influenced how you've engaged with that community and other communities you've connected with? Yes, um, that opens a, a lot of questions in relation to my faith. Um, you know, it's, I think, just just with your faith and, and just with your dress it, it 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 puts people on it can put people on 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 the defensive so i have to be mindful of how people are perceiving me and i do get that i really understand that uh you know and and i'm i'm happy to approach people with an open mind trying to open their minds up uh, as mine has been, uh, let them ask the, the re most relevant questions, answer those questions. A lot of people do ask, um, so you're a filmmaker, Rabia, um, how does that work for you as a female 
with your faith, you know, because it's not it's not a commonplace that a, a, a you know a, a Muslim female is 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 in this industry, and it doesn't stop me uh, as a filmmaker. If anything, it gives me uh, a little bit more energy, let's say, to want to prove to them that you, whatever you want to do, you can do. You know, my faith uh, in my film making, I suppose it does come through sometimes. Uh, you know, I want to portray the, the, the correct image. You know, I, 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 I do work with boundaries as well. I am mindful of the boundaries of what I'm showing within my, within my films. Um, but yes, you know, I do have my faith and, you know, and if, if I wanted to make a film about my faith, I would make a film about my faith. Thank you. Thank you for that. We, we may well come back to those those questions about about how your faith supports your work. I'm going to move on to Samir now uh, to ask him to say a little bit more about his work. Um, obviously, by contrast, Samir, the, the art form that you have immersed yourself in has got this incredibly long heritage. Um, and um, uh, I imagine that at some stage in your career, you will have felt this as a great weight on you, perhaps, because you were following on from so many other calligraphers and because there was such a, a clearly defined tradition and therefore perhaps that breaking out of that tradition was was a challenge. Am I right in that or would you like to say something else about how that how that's been for you? I, I can understand why you, 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 you think that way, but um, I know a little bit of background. I actually, I mean, I was born to a Muslim household, which I viewed as very authoritarian and oppressive yeah, as a teenager. So I, I, I left Islam and I, I, I researched uh, Buddhism, went on a Buddhist pilgrimage through India, learned Hebrew, went to Jerusalem, hung out with all kinds of different people. Because my mom told me that, you know, we have a duty to, to explore the world and go and search for our own answers and God will lead us always back to, to who he is. Um, and so I was always seen as a kind of a rebel and I, I hated that, but I wore that badge proudly for a long time. Mm. And it was just like, it was like, oh yeah, I do things differently. So when I came back, I, I wanted to really explore and bring, for me, what was more important was, um, okay. I started calligraphy properly because I realized that in the Arab world in Syria, we use an amazing language that's steeped in, in, in deeply in, in, in God and, and, and spirit and faith. And my experience was that most people take it for granted. So I want to make those words beautiful. So people look at them and say, oh, wow, that's beautiful. And then realize what they actually say. And I got asked very often in, when, I, when I was studying in Syria, why I keep writing Christian calligraphy in Arabic. And I'd look at the, the questioner and say, no, but this is from the Quran or this is from, you know, Islamic tradition, because I, I wanted to find that common thread that wasn't necessarily Christian or Muslim, but was human. And like, like Miriam said earlier, it's, just, it's that find that, that, that humanity that, that lies deep within us and try and draw that out and share that so other people can see that and say, wow, I know that. Oh, maybe I could express that as well in my own beautiful way. Um, and I, I was very privileged to have really amazing mentors, teachers, guides, people who just put their hand on my back and said, that's good, go do that. You know, it was, it was like a blessing. And so I went and did that. And so being, I, I, I kind of wore this badge proudly of um, not following tradition, but trying to kind of get traditional in a way. And I used, you know, I used to hear lots of times in my early exhibitions, Arabs would come and say, Yane, it's lovely, it's beautiful, but it's all wrong. And I, I'd be like, yes, it's all wrong, but it's like, it's me. And so that's why, I've, and I, you know, I've, in, the, in the years I've done lots of work with, with um, uh, the Jewish community, the Christian community, I've done exhibitions in churches, I've worked, I've done work in Hebrew, in Sanskrit, because for me, the, the beauty of the art, whichever form it takes, whether it's film or whether it's storytelling or art in like calligraphy or canvas or digital, like pieces beautiful work, it's about finding that common thread of humanity that, that we instill in that piece of art. 
and the human beings recognize that that bit of humanity, even if they don't understand it. So lots of my clients for the first 10 years couldn't read Arabic, uh, didn't understand what it said, but they knew somehow what I'd written or what I'd created. And it, it inspired and excited them that they could read something they couldn't really read with the eyes, but could read with the heart. And that, that was, um, yeah. I mean, the last five years, I've become a bit more traditional because I've had work from the, the Saudi embassy, the Bahrain embassy. And so I have kind of, um, I've, I've, I've like created a little niche where my work has traditional kind of legs up with it, but it's still different. And I always struggle. Um, one of my challenges is to always try and make my art more authentic and different. And I, I'm, I'm on that journey still every day. Does that answer your question? Sorry, it's a long... That does, that does. Um, I mean, yeah. all everyone's answers so far have been beautifully eloquent. And and what I pick from, from that uh, matches a bit what has been said by other speakers, which is that you're not arguing with people, as it were, to try no. and persuade them. You are no. showing them something which might connect with them as human beings. Yeah. It might be beautiful. It, it might have some challenges in it. But then you're letting people change themselves if they wish to. Um, because mm. we know that that's how to move hearts and mind how to move minds is by moving hearts it's the only way through example and through showing yeah in yes. my experience I, i'm tempted therefore to ask you well i will ask you whether you yeah. feel that there is there are other people coming behind you younger samirs if you don't mind me saying who will have the same desire to kind of change what you're doing and represent it do you sense there is a movement in i i i see it i see it actively and it makes it moves me it just uh, really touches me deeply that we have so many young people who have the attitude to express what's deep inside them and they're doing it. And we live in an amazing world where it's so easy now with making, you know, telling stories online, writing, doing documentary. It's like the, the tools are so readily available and what we, yeah, and these people have stories to tell or art to create. And it's really happening. You know, it's, um, I, I was at an exhibition a few years ago in Manchester where the three headlining artists, when they were interviewed, all said, pointed at me and said, oh, it's his fault. You know, he's, <laughs> I spoke to him 10 years ago and he, he gave me advice here and there. And I just started crying. So I just realized that my life has meaning because there's other people who I, it's just that they, they've taken what I've given Legacy. them, even when I wasn't sure. And they've run with it, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful world. All, just, all the world in my beautiful place. I, I Actually, Sammy, you were one of one of my first supporters, if I recall. Yeah, yeah. We, we, me, me and Tidsta collaborated in two thousand six. Two thousand six was it? Yeah, something like that. Back in the day. Yeah, and with so many artists, and I, it's it's lovely. It's just like it's just beautiful. I'm so proud of the young. That's why I teach actively. You know, I've had to really struggle to learn how to teach with Microsoft Teams and Zoom in schools, but I've managed it now because it's, and the, the results that come are just so beautiful. It's like, wow, you know, when I'm an old man, the world's going to be full of beautiful things that, I'll, that will inspire and touch and move me. That's, yeah. that's amazing listening to you guys, because I thought when Jonathan asked you the questions to me, I was thinking, hold on, isn't Teekster in this conversation? <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's a there's a connection there. But I was also listening to you and thinking it's amazing that you had role models and mentors and that you are able to pass that on, which is actually also uh, a very the, the Islamic principle of kind of helping foster the next generation Absolutely. in their values, yeah. in their art, whatever it may be. I would just like to ask. Um, you know, I, as, a, as a Muslim woman in the community, I feel like there is a lot of absence of mentorship for uh, young women uh, yeah. or women more generally. And I would love to see some of that mentorship extended to the sisters. I think increasingly I'm seeing, you know, Muslim men kind of really doing their thing in the public sphere and I applaud it. Um, and, and I love the way that they will help their brothers, you know, move up with them. And But I don't see as much support for women is the truth and I have to I have to say it because it's it's mm. unfortunately a real issue it means people don't have the confidence you know that little push that that, that teaks that maybe you were given when Samir was like yes you're on the right path like 
everyone needs that. Everyone needs to feel like there's someone rooting for your journey. Um, so yes, yeah, mm. sorry, in my little two no, no, yeah. that's, that's really good. Um, may, may I say something to that? Yes, but Samir, I, you I, agree. On, and then I, I'd like to ask Rabia for her views. Yeah. As a woman. Very quickly. Um, I agree 100% with you, Miriam. But what I've seen is there is a massive, amazing crowd of young women creatives who are out there doing stuff, but it hasn't gelled yet. And it's about to. Because it is, and they're there, I they're hope about so. to. Yeah, yeah, no, they are. Yeah. I, I mean, I see them. I see them in, in my, my communities on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. I just think, wow, this is amazing. And they all know each other. So it's about to kind of explode on the scene. I pray because we need that because, you know, the young women have so much to give. Yeah. Actually, Summer, Sorry. just to quickly add on the back yeah, of that. And then Rabia. Yeah. Uh, and then if you, uh, you're probably right on the kind of larger scale, but if you actually watch closely at the grassroots level, you'll see yeah. this tidal wave of female creatives out in the world. Uh, maybe they haven't exposed themselves uh, or maybe they haven't got the same amount of kind of attention, but it, the... Correct they actually they are there um it's just yeah. that you have to go find them um so that's always been the case so women have always hustled the grassroots we've had that down we've done all the graft all the the, the cleaning the cooking the organizing we've been there don't worry we got the t-shirt and the rest of it what hasn't happened has been the hand up to lift us from those positions to the positions of authority or leadership or seniorship that still isn't happening unfortunately in my opinion Okay, uh, I will be moving on to Tikta in a moment, but I, I, I think we should hear if Rabia has a view about whether she has had uh, role models, whether she's had assistance to get to the position she's got to. Rabia, can I ask you that question? It's, it's, it's quite a difficult one to answer uh, for myself. Remember, a rich a deaf being deaf is a richness I see it from. So, but I have a double barrier. Let's say I'm a female. I'm I'm, I'm also deaf. Um, okay, let me try and think and, and answer it generally. I think the first thing the hearing community would see me as when I use the word deaf, they question what that is. A lot of people do not still know what that means. It's on a long list. So I say to people, okay, it's not a negative. Let's see it as a positive. The only issue we have uh, within society, uh, we know there's lots of barriers, but being a deaf female, uh, that adds to the barriers. And what I try to do is support people and by producing things and making things to show that there's a richness coming from the female deaf community and the female community that I suppose we have to prove ourselves, don't we? If anything, it gives us more strength, I think. You know, we show people we can do it. We are actually quite empowered uh, to be able to do that as well. I, th I, th I think we could show it from that side. OK, th thank you for that question. I, I, I sense that we're going to come back to this, uh, this point uh, about to what extent you have to be uh, a role model for other people and to what extent it would be nice to have the doors opened more easily as, as so often happens for, for men in this world. Uh, but before we move into that conversation, um, Teekster, just to, to uh, have another uh, conversation with you, particularly about how your work has um, developed this combination of having a traditional uh, uh, inspiration, but also being very much a contemporary visual artist. When I looked at the images you showed us, when I looked at your CV, I realise yours is the kind of work I could have seen in the Icon Gallery in Birmingham or any number of contemporary art galleries. Um, I might not have expected to find it there, but I, I hopefully could find it there. How have you found navigating between being a, 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 a traditional, an artist with a traditional background, perhaps, to an artist who's working in such a contemporary way with, with their digital work and so on? Very broad question, I'm afraid. Yeah, no, no, I think this is a... a quite an um, important subject matter um, because a lot of the time we I think as Muslims we always tend to look at the past and think that's the golden age I mean when it comes to artwork I believe some things if some things can't um, don't have to be broken to be improved um, and I think a lot of people think oh that was the golden period just leave it at that but 
I think personally, I know what I do is different, but if you're a strict traditionalist, you can't create anything which is considered revolutionary. Often people keep up, you know, a firm grasp on the past. Um, but I believe that, you know, if you want to create, especially as a McCart, it's all about the future. Um, I'll explain what I'll expand what I mean. I mean, um, we often look as in uh, at Islamic art in this nostalgic way, and it seems something that is quite far away. But I should, but I believe that we should look to the past in a critical way, and bring from the past uh, the best elements and bring it into the future. And that's the concept which I use personally. I like to involve classic designs from the Islamic world and give them a contemporary spin. When I personally create artwork, I don't believe in limitations. You should be free to imagine, dream, and transfer whatever emotion you have inside of you. Um, but I may say those things, but at the end of the day, we cannot ignore the masters of the past because without them, we are leaderless. But essentially, we should be using them as a foundation. And I think this is probably um, one of the core elements of Islamic art, where, where I think it's probably better than other art, is that it's... Because when you see some other, some art, it's all about the ego. You're trying to show your ego is on, pres is on presentation. Look, look how clever I am. Look how sophisticated. I've done this. I, I, me, me, me. It's about the person. But with the Islamic art, it's nothing to do about you. It's nothing to do about your ego. It's about sending a major message which is greater than yourself. It's about, you know, um, it's about the divine and basically shouting out his glory. And it's nothing to do with you. And I think this is why is in the Islamic household, Islamic art is so important, is that you have this constant visual reminder. And then because I think some people think that Islamic art is a luxury. It shouldn't be because it is a luxury, it's a necessity. We should be um, filling our houses with beauty because beauty is a connection to the divine. Um, and then, you know, this kind of like beautification and I'm, I like to personally think I'm helping towards that journey or adding towards the journey because when you think about art in itself at the end of the day when you create an artwork you're also expressing a slight element of your, just yourself and your personal experiences as well so using all those kind of like emotions and techniques and kind of things I like I kind of could um, create something new I know when even myself, when I see something new, like Apple releasing a product, you go, oh my God, here we go again. What are you going to do? I mean, people, when they see my, they sometimes fear new, but it's, but sometimes you need to and not be worried about what other people think and just basically create stuff which you believe is important. Thank you. That, that's, that's very interesting to hear. This, this sort of tension balance maybe between expressing your individuality, but also creating something that can be experienced as a community and isn't about your individuality. That, that's, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to uh, move on to one of the questions we've had in the chat, in fact, which I'm going to put to Miriam to start with, and perhaps others will be able to answer it as well. Um, someone has asked about the experiences that you have all had working with arts and cultural institutions in Britain uh, as uh, creative Muslims. What kind of experience that has, has, has caused you? Uh, if you'd like to reflect on that for a moment, that would be really interesting. I'll start with Miriam and, and then I will move on to our other speakers. It's a very big question again, Miriam, I'm afraid. Well, it's not that, it's, it's perhaps not the most relevant for me because I tend to work for broadcasters. So um, I might just pass that on to others if that's all right. I mean. Okay. I mean, the, the only one I can really talk to is, you know, Brit Doc and uh, kind of the, the big funds for film in this country, which are actually very small funds, mm. uh, extremely competitive. The uh, arts, the world of arts was already massively underfunded um, prior to COVID. And obviously we know that now it's uh, a sector which is hugely under assault and needs defense and pushback. Um, so, I, but I'll leave it to others to, to talk about their experiences of it because I um, can only just say that uh, BritDoc can only can only support very few people uh, and nowhere near as many as need it. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. We, I, I, we will. I'm, I hope we'll have more questions for you anyway. Um, but I will direct that question then to Rabia about uh, whether you can say uh, anything about the experience you've had uh, uh, as uh, a Muslim creative person within uh, arts and cultural institutions in the UK, whether they have been particularly helpful or, or otherwise, whether feelings or responses have changed over the years that you've been working, perhaps. I think if, if we look back in history and what I'm seeing now, um, is there much funding for, for, for Muslim art? I don't, I don't know, I'll, I'll pose that as a question uh, to, to other people as well. I, I think the, the problem we have is there's probably too many people applying for too few funds, that's, that's the issue. There isn't enough funding available. I think it's got better. Um, I think it's become more popular. I think it's become more generic, let's say. I think, uh, you know, the art world is more inclusive for uh, different religions, different disabilities. And like it's already said, uh, been said, you know, problems with the current pandemic, funding issues, funding cuts, uh, that. And I think last year, November of last year, um, you know, I think people were doing a lot of campaigning uh, just, just, and I think it was a hashtag. I'm trying to think what it was now, uh, and saying that you know we need to be supporting uh, art creatives to save this industry uh, across the UK because funding is not being made available. You know, so we were a little bit, I would say, neglected by the funders uh, who were making decisions to fund other other areas over the arts uh, world. Uh, so that that's my take on it. Okay, thank you, uh, Samir. You've you've worked with very many different institutions in the UK and obviously across the world. Do you have any observations about how different institutions that have access to funding and influence and so on, how they responded to you differently, depending on where they were? I think I, I would agree a lot with Rabia, what Rabia said. It, um, I mean, me personally, I, I stopped asking institutions for funding a long, long time ago because it was just, it seemed like an uphill struggle and seemed very often not to get anywhere. So I decided just to do my work, just keep my head down and keep creating, keep creating. And I think that's one thing that's, that, that's got me work is when people look at artists and they say, okay, there was like five different artists 20 years ago, but only one's still there. Let's call him because I'm still around. You know, I, I get the work. Yeah. And it's just... Uh, stubbornness and tenacity and just 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 keeping at it keeping at it i've been through lots of ups and downs i've i've used many different means of making money you know different avenues of work to support my art because my art very very important to me but i also realized that you know mouths have to be fed and lights have to be on and yeah as for everyone and i just made a choice not to not to rely on institutions but just just do the work just I think I got that from my father my father you know instilled that in me that a real man as he called it you know just goes to work in the morning comes back exhausted in the evening and it's it's a uh, it goes to work just does the work you know just just do the work and that's that's what I've done mm. so uh, my I mean I, I don't really have much of an opinion on different institutions okay <coughs> sorry okay. maybe Tink still would know Maybe Tix would know. Yes, Tix, uh, you, you've, I imagine in your work, you have engaged with Arts Council of England and local authorities and uh, funding organisations that want to see art happen. Um, how do you, how's that been for you as a, as, as a developing a Muslim artist? Um, I, I, I don't want to sound too negative here, but I want to be a bit, a bit positive here as well. Uh, I think, like Samir said, and Miriam, and it's been up and down. Sometimes I've been lucky with funding, and then sometimes the amount of effort that you 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 put into it, it would be better off just robbing a bank. Probably take less work. Um, and I'm not really, I'm not suggesting you do that. But um, it's it's been it's 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 kind of I've realized if you're the flavor of the month things doors open a lot more easier yeah. 
Mm. Um, no matter what in the creative circle, if I had about five million followers and I was the latest thing on, you know, the top of the charts, doors open quite easily. And ironically, but, you wouldn't need the doors to open, which is the annoying bit. Exactly. <laughs> but on the flip side of that, um, it's a, it's a, it's about perseverance. Um, and I think that's one of the most key things it is, is that no matter what criticism you get or negativity is perseverance, but it's also one of the crucial is, is time management um, as well. Is what you're trying to achieve worth the time that you're going to invest in it? So it's about payback as well. If you're just scrummaging around for a few thousand pounds or a few hundred pounds, is it worth your time? Um, rather than you know going to because some of my projects I haven't went I haven't went to a, like a crowdsourcing um, platform and I crowdsource some projects to get them off the ground or sometimes personal investment and stuff but um, I think the, especially now with institutions um, I think especially with the COVID thing is that it's a lot more tighter now and a bit a lot more difficult. Yes. Um, we, we do have a question actually about how you as creatives have fared during the pandemic. But before we come to that one, uh, there's an earlier question in our question answer uh, box here, which was uh, for Rabia, but possibly uh, Miriam may also have a version of the answer, which is the question was for Rabia was what advice would you give to Muslim women who wish to go into the field of filmmaking, the field of filmmaking and producing? Uh, and, and perhaps Miriam can answer the question from the point of view of her work as a journalist and documentary filmmaker. But Rabia, first of all, do you have any particular advice for Muslim women that you could share? My advice to Muslim females would be, be yourself. Always be yourself. Any criticism that comes your way, build on it. You have to have the confidence and the vision to create what you want to create and have a very clear aim and objective. No matter what you're creating, it might be feature films, short films, documentaries, your job is to tell stories. Yes, we know funding is a difficult area. You can possibly crowdfund it, like um, has already been mentioned. But if there is no funding, maybe your last resort is, I don't know, do you put your, your, your own hand uh, in your pocket? I suppose you do. You pay for it yourself. If, if you don't create those opportunities for yourself, nothing will come your way. And what you're going to be producing will hopefully have an impact on other people and it will be there to make change. I think it's, it's, it's the old story of roll up your sleeves and get stuck in. OK, uh, that's that's interesting. I mean, I'm conscious of what uh, Miriam said a moment ago, which is that those people who are being very successful, the doors are opening without much effort and perhaps they don't need the support. And obviously, if you have to pay for your work yourself, that presents a real challenge, particularly if you're from a low income background, perhaps. But um, Miriam, do you have any uh, any particular advice from your sector that you could offer to Muslim women particularly who want to be in your world? I mean, we, uh, Rabia and I have overlapping, obviously, uh, sectors, and I completely agree with kind of knowing yourself and knowing uh, exactly what stories you want to tell, because the industry will uh, pick you up, juice you and throw, throw you out once they're done. So you need to make sure that as you enter it, you're absolutely clear why you're in the room and what it is that you want to bring to that conversation. You also have to be really clear on your own boundaries. What are you there to do? Are you there as a citizen, you know, what we call a native informant? Are you here to spill the beans on everyone's dark secrets? Is that the role you want to play? Or what is it that you actually want to tell? Uh, are you aware that when you go into um, filmmaking or broadcasting for a mainstream broadcaster, you are making TV, you are making film for what we call Middle Britain? Nothing wrong with that, but we live in a society with a lot of negative preconceptions about Muslims. And any conversation that you wish to engage the wider society in on Muslims will begin at the level at which they have understanding of that community. If you're not prepared to speak to people at the level of understanding currently had about Muslims, which is poor and uh, prejudicial and frankly insulting a lot of the time, if you're not prepared to engage at that level, then don't make films related to your identity. 
go into the industry as a Muslim woman who's informed by a set of values that will guide you and strengthen you and give you solace by all means and ha- hold on to that because you're going to need it. It's a rocky ride. <laughs> but, but, it, but, but, but if we're talking about going into it because you want to tell stories about your identity or the identities of those around you, uh, you should be afraid. You should be uh, very afraid about what you're stepping into, why you're stepping into it, uh, and ultimately what you're being used in the uh, service of. Because ultimately, as a rookie in any industry, uh, when opportunities come your way, many people will have to say yes because of funding or the absence of it. Um, And you will have to make very difficult decisions uh, that often involve the choice between maybe selling your house or uh, selling out your community, which, you know, um, this this is going to sound harsh, but it's TV in particular is based on catching people's attention with very limited um, attention spans. Um, And so it's less about kind of ABC, this is how it is, this is what it was, as much as it is about kind of um, being extremely sensational. Um, And I think you have to be really aware of where you stand in that conversation before entering the arena. Yes. And and with your work, and Miriam, from what what I know of it, you you have had to navigate that very difficult world in order to give yourself agency when it comes to how you present yourself and your community and your faith. I, I'm sensing because you've been working for for a while now and you've been successful, but to some extent you have got some agency now. Do, do you feel that you've made much progress, or is it still that relentless uphill battle against against ignorance and, and prejudice? So it's a very difficult question to answer because, um, alhamdulillah, I'm doing okay, but I think I should be a lot more successful than I am. <laughs> And that's the truth. Um, And I think probably everyone sitting on this panel probably thinks the same. Um, And I say that because I think that we all are doing what we do. We're all engaged in our art form because we think we have something of value to contribute to the wider conversation. Um, We wouldn't be doing this if we didn't. That's obviously a big factor in why we do what we do. And when you don't feel that that necessarily gets heard on its own terms or when you, um, I mean, the only equivalent I can give would be, imagine Samir uh, putting forward one of his finished, beautiful pieces of work and somebody saying, we love it, but you know what would work really well? Why don't we just daub some graffiti all over it? That would be sensational. That would speak to Jane so much more. Um, And you've got to figure out whether, you know, you want to sell that work to Jane or whether you want to sell the work as it was to three people or, you know, inshallah for Samir, it's a whole lot more than that. But it's a it's a very um, do do I feel? Yeah, I'm I'm being very honest. You're going to have to forgive me. I only know that language. But um, it's it's a ridiculously harsh industry that involves vying for ratings for people who are increasingly desensitized to subtlety. Mm. And unless you were prepared to engage in that battlefield and acquire some scars along the way, and by scars, I mean making mistakes. And by the way, we're a community which is very unforgiving of mistakes because a lot of our mistakes are taken to be symbolic of some kind of a... um, sort of uh, existential stance uh, rather than, you know, navigating very poorly a very tough environment without any uh, allies or mentors there to guide you along the way. And that's why I emphasize the, the, the conversation around mentors, because unfortunately it isn't that we don't have uh, Muslims in uh, important positions in this country now. And I mean by that in, in uh, commissioners, um, uh, senior producers, um, in production companies heading up development, Um, I just mean that the uh, allyship that we've seen from the uh, African-American community, for example, the way that it's a community that has banded together to really bring up the best of its talent, nurture that talent, and in fact today stands at the pinnacle, in my view, of what is American culture. Um, We have every opportunity to be part of a similar uh, an, an inspired movement of that genre, uh, except we have very few people with the balls to stand up and actually do the work to get it done. And, you know, until we do, we will forever be chasing. Okay, that's that's really interesting what you said there, of course. And, and 
um, well, depressing, I suppose, in a way. Sorry, to... it's a bit bleak. No, no, no. It, you still, the, the struggle is a struggle. Life yeah. is str yeah. struggle. Like we're Muslims. We, we, we were put on this earth knowing that life isn't going to be easy. And, and the truth is, guys, if this is the worst struggle you go through in your life, alhamdulillah, like you have come out doing okay. <laughs> that okay. is the truth. Yeah. But we still have to fight the good fight. We have to remember why we're in the arena. We have to push back against elements which seek to commodify our identity in a way that actually is demoralizing and detrimental to, I think, not just our community, but society as a whole. Mm -hmm. Well, I, that's the point I'm going to raise with Teakster now then. Um, anybody involved in visual art, of course, is, is in danger of being caught up in that visual art world, which is constantly about commodifying and capitalizing uh, finite pieces of physicality. Uh, when you, Teakster, and indeed Samir, and, and in fact all of you have talked about the fact that you are working as artists because of your relationship with the divine, which is not about your relationship with a bank account, it's about relationship with spiritual matters. Teakster, have you had moments when you felt you had to back away from a project because of oh, there was money there, there was an offer there, you felt that to go forward you would be compromising your faith or your, your, or your person as an artist? Um. This has happened on a couple of accounts um, where there was easily a good payout, but it was against something which I didn't believe in. Mm -hmm. um, and to say turning it down didn't kill me would be a lie because it was like a ridiculous amount of money. Uh, but then at the end of the day, um, you have to think about like Miriam said, what are your morals? What are your guidelines? Um, for example, Actually, I won't name the companies, but it was co co it was companies that operated in the element of vice, so we say, yeah. and they kind of loved my designs and they wanted me to pro promote some some of their items. But deep down, part of me is like, wow, that's that's a free holiday to Dubai <laughs> done and dusted. By the way, I'm not a big fan of Dubai, um, but um, but then I had to check back because at the moment I have a strong following with me as well who believe in the things which I design. Now for me to sell out, not only would I be selling out my own conscience, I'll be selling out the people who support my work um, and who follow me. Um, and then and in the end is selling your soul. I mean, you can sell your soul at any price, but to buy it back is an even deep, uh, bigger price. So in the end, and then the end, I kind of thought. Well, I took. A, I also listened to my brain as well because I said, "Well, this doesn't really match with what I do. This is not what I'm all about." So I had to turn them down. But it's at the end of the day, you have to keep your morals in line. Otherwise, if you lose yourself, then you know, yeah, you don't know where you are. Yeah, that that's interesting. I, I mean, we're, we're getting a sort of a story here, a picture here of of you as artists, all of you. Um, uh, pushing against the inherent nature of art in a contemporary Western society, perhaps, which is to commodify art and culture and to sell it back to us in a particular way, which will generate the maximum revenue for those who happen to own the capital that is financing it. Uh, you can tell I'm the son of a communist, can't you? These, uh, these stories die hard. Um, I also had a very uh, austere father, Samir. Um, he would have had the same uh, ethos as, as you had, uh, your father had about working hard. But um, but th there are things which are more important, of course, as Teacher has said, than, than just taking the money and, and having the holiday. Um, to switch now to Samir, a similar question. Um, I mean, you've got to a stage now where it sounds like, to some extent, you can pick and choose who you work for and what you do. But I wonder whether early on in your career, particularly when people were starting to take notice in your work, did you find yourself in danger of not selling out exactly, but feeling that you were working more for the dollar than for the divine? Um, my experience is very similar to, to what the others have said. And, um, one thing I've realized in my career as an artist is at, at the top level, I'm striving towards excellence, excellence in handling a brush and ink or ha excellence in the way I create something, but also excellence in my conduct. And it's very important. I mean, Miriam brought up the, 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 the point a few times about we need mentors and there's lots of kids who communicate with me and I have to be so careful that I stay on true to my own values. I mean, I, I have a thing, 
an artist about 15 years ago told me that one, one of the steps to becoming rich as an artist is doing a gratefulness journal. Every night before I sleep, I write five things I'm grateful for and five things that you know, I should forgive or ask forgiveness for the next day. I looked at that person and said, what do you mean? Like, what, what's the God doing making lots of money? And he said, you can't fool the universe. <laughs> it's like you're, you're, it's like we're fighting a cosmic battle. And that's beautiful because it's, because it's cosmic. We do what we can and God does the rest, you know? And um, w- what I've learned to do over the years is every, every few years, I'll just say, look, God, show me that I'm making a difference. Show me that, you know, my life has meaning. And suddenly people call me up and say, you know, six years ago, you told me to do that thing. Well, guess what happened? Or, you know, you know, you, you did that thing, you sent that name, you did that name of my child. And now they're going to use it, you know, for this and whatever. And it's, it's like this feedback comes back. So for me, it's always been so important. There's been so many opportunities to sell out. There's so many opportunities to, to compromise on my values. But maybe it's the way I was brought up by my parents, bless them. But I, for me, that's actually, it, it causes a pain when I think about it. When I think about, should I sell out? Because I, I, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing it for, because it's my, my gift to the world, because we all come with gifts for the world. You know, like Rabia's gift is, there's images we saw, it's just like, I, I, I can't wait to explore that further. I just like, wow. And like, Miriam, I want to like check out her showreel and teach that I know and love his work. But these are, we're, we're all privileged to give our gifts to the world. And I don't want to dirty that. I don't want to, it's not about money. It's about me and the world and God and everything. I mean, maybe that's uh, making it too general, but it is, is, is on that scale. It's cosmic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sammy, I just want to add other something on the back of that. I mean, yeah. how do you define riches or rich? Because there's a famous mm. Muslim quote that goes, you can give a man a mountain of gold but they'll demand another mountain of gold this human hunger doesn't really go away sorry Mary, true, you're... But, but we all just need to live right yeah that's true <laughs> like, that's true, that's I think true. between between the mountain of gold like bro i'm good i don't need the millions but i do need to live and i need mm. to be able to not you know be in a position like so many of us uh, who are creatives currently having to hustle you know for lifetimes I see I see some of the most talented artists that I know who are on a hustle late in their lives and I'm like this is not right there's just even as a community like there it's not like the Muslim community doesn't have money like we we, when it comes to to funding things like we literally well we know this right that the Muslim community gives the largest proportion of charity than any other community in the Britain Uh, we do have money but where we choose to put our money is never in the arts and that is such a massive failure because in the arts is our potential to touch hearts and minds we're all for building things great we need prayer space alhamdulillah i think we're in a country i mean i'm originally from france we could do with a few more mosques in france but in this country you know what we really need we need better I'm going to call it PR for want of a better word. And when you want to talk PR, you're talking about transmitting what we truly stand for, the heart and soul of who we are as Muslims. That is found in our artistic output. And yet there is zero money being put into us. Well, you get what you pay for, guys. You want to come crying about, oh, we're misrepresented, pay up. You want good artists out on the mainstream, pay up. Otherwise, don't come crying because the rest of us are out here trying to hustle our whole time. And I'm just going to speak the truth because people always want to come along and say, oh, I want to be an artist. I want to be in the arts. It's a sector that needs funding. It's a sector that needs funding. Where are our academies? Where are our scholarships? We have scholarships for master's degrees. Fantastic. What about the arts? What about people like everyone on this panel trying to put out a vision of who we are that's actually inspiring, not trying to push back against Islamophobia. We need that too, but just plainly just allowing us to exist in Mm. the public sphere as who we are, as the range of who we are. Sorry, it's, it's a very emotive subject for me because I've been in the field long enough to see not enough change in my perspective. Yeah. Yeah. There are, there are lots of comments in the chat room uh, supporting I mean, everything you're saying there, uh, Miriam, and, and lovely comments from other people about other 
people's comments. Um, and, and clearly the, the, the idea that for artists to be constantly concerned, worried on the fret and not even to have a small hill of gold to rely on. OK, it's a romantic idea, but people enjoy that. But actually, the first two or three years may be. But if you're in your whatever generation you are, by the end, you don't want to have to worry about the gas bill. If you're an artist, you want to be able to pay the gas bill and do your art, I imagine. Which brings me to what might be our final question as we're getting close to the end of our session. Um, somebody has asked about the experience of uh, the pandemic for you as creative people. Um, I, I can't imagine it's made life particularly easier, but I wonder if there is anything about this global experience we've all, we're all going through but do you feel will offer a glimmer of hope to artists and in, in your cases, Muslim artists? Could I start with Rabia about that question? Is there anything about the pandemic which you feel might in the end be of value to us as a, as a society? Well, I think, Sorry, Miriam, what you said to me has, has, has hit home, really. I'm feeling quite emotional about what you just said. And, and, I, and I think, you know, we have the opportunity to make change. We have to remember that. Let's influence the mainstream. Let's use social media, your Facebook accounts, your Instagram, your Twitters. Let's use them because pe more people are using them. Uh, during this pandemic. Let's show the positive. Let's show how change can happen. Lead by example. You know, let's not talk in the negative. Uh, let's not be critical. Let's get the positivities out there. And hopefully that will influence change. You know, we, we need to take control of this situation and say, right, OK, this is fact. This is how it is. But in a pos with a positive uh, slant on it. I think we have the opportunity, you know, I, you know, I, I think it's an opportunity for us to, to raise our own voices within society now and to use technology to do that. OK, thank you. So the fact that we can all communicate so easily with each other across the whole world is something which we might take as a as a positive from uh, this very negative experience. Thank you. Uh, Samir, the, the same question for you as as an artist working both digitally and also uh, uh, in real space. How has this experience affected your art? How do you think it will affect you in the future? Um, good question. I mean, most of my work, I, I love the physical aspect of art. So I used to do lots and lots of like events where I'd go down and do live calligraphy. And I love those, I live for those. And they paid really well and suddenly they're all gone. Mm. I sat there scratching my head thinking, okay, I'm going to pay this bill now. How do I do this now? <laughs> oh, no. So I had to really run, uh, recreate stuff. So I started offering work on, you know, for really great prices on, on Facebook and all over the place. And the response was phenomenal. So I spent like weeks and weeks hardly sleeping, just creating, 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 and posting it all off. And I'm on Facebook, first name terms with my postman now. And with the guy at the post office, and so that was really, really good. Do, do you can and I? Do you think yeah. you are getting to a broader range of people because you don't have to physically meet in a space, but because you can connect with them digitally? People beyond the Muslim community, for instance, who might start to understand your work. I'm thinking about what Miriam said about mm -hmm. art needs to be a way of introducing people to the reality of communities, and actually, it's a lovely mm -hmm. way of doing it because people go in because they see your images and they're beautiful. And they want to know yeah. what the words mean. And they want to know where True. you come from. Has that happened to you uh, in the pandemic? I, I think so, yeah. I, I had lots of interest from the States, from, from Africa, from across Europe. And, you know, just did loads of work that got sent out there. And I was just like, I, I, I didn't do much very often, but suddenly I did lots of it. And that was really, really exciting for me. What I realised is it was just like, still my my journey as an artist is just striving for excellence so i started creating work that gave me solace in this time or gave me direction like the first piece i did was a uh, i realized when this this is this horrible virus is let loose and the whole world's gone crazy and i my mom used to say 
La haula la kuat ba ila bila. Like there's no power in the whole universe greater than God. It doesn't matter what's happening, God. So we hold on to the rope of God, we stay in Islam. So I did that as a beautiful calligraphy. And I, I started exploring that. And it was really, for me, it was really beautiful to, to, to go back to basics in a way on my journey. All the superfluous stuff just fell away and I had to focus on what's really, really important to me as a human being. What do I need? Um, and I, I, we're all suffering. I mean, I, I bumped into a friend of mine in the supermarket the other day. And I, I just started crying because I couldn't hug them, yeah. you know, and I just I realized how much I, I miss sitting in a cafe with a friend watching the world <laughs> go by and doing nothing in particular, but that was such an important, lovely, beautiful part of my life. And now it's not there. Yeah. And I, and so I, I, I could like look at, okay, I, I, I'm sad. I'm traumatized. I need solace. I need kind of comfort. How can I express that through my art that others will see that and also get solace and comfort and, you know, and so that, that, yeah. that's a beautiful thing because we're all sharing this right now. Yeah. This experience globally. Yeah. Thank you. I, I will stop you there. We, we've only got three yeah. minutes left. Oh, so I'm sorry. One yeah. minute to Tikster yeah. and one minute to Miriam to, to, to reflect if they want to about anything positive about the experience we're going through. Tikster, has is there anything positive about the pandemic for you? Um, <laughs> um, I think I've enjoyed my personal space uh, more than anything else. But yeah. on the back of that, I mean, one of the questions which like you mentioned earlier, is like how thing how people can support people in in the artist world. Um, if um, one of the most important things, if you have an artist or a creative or someone in the creative industry as a follower, one of the best things you could do to support them is probably buy their work. Yeah. Um, um, and actually support them, and that's probably one of the crucial things. A, because they know that someone believes in them, and do they could carry on with the way you know with work that they are doing. I mean, if you can't do that, I mean, if you can do offer more than that, if you can offer sponsorships and stuff like that to actually help people. There's a lot of masters in the past, like Mozart and Beethoven, that they're actually, you know, sponsored to carry on to do their work. That's a, so if you have someone that you believe in, you could have an offer sponsorship. And the littlest and the minimalistic thing you could do is share their work with different crowds and stuff. If you actually believe they share, it costs nothing just to raise their profile. Because some, like Mariam said, that some amazing female artists there that which haven't got the exposure, just share their work with your circles to show commercial to give them that exposure, and hopefully it will hit the right person and help them along their career. Lovely. So that's my positive note that I want to finish well, off. Of. I'll leave the. That's a really nice way to finish. Cheeks to oh. we'll have a few a few words to Miriam. So what you're saying is, you everybody can make a small difference, even if it's only by sharing the experience existence of some other artist. But exactly. if they can manage to buy some work or to support a project, then that's better. Uh, Miriam, obviously your industry is massive and expensive, <coughs> and sadly I can't afford to commission a, a piece of documentary report. Anyone got a hundred k hanging around that Probably you want to? Not send my way. No, not yet. Okay. <laughs> Have you seen anything positive though from this experience we're all going through? Um, Industry-wise, um, I think a lot of things are up in the air. To be honest, I mean, I you know been working on a film that's been on hold um, because it involves international travel and. Uh, that's been that's been very difficult uh, emotionally but I have to trust in God's timing uh, and that's and that there, there must be some baraka in that but I maybe what I can speak to is more to the uh, impact of the pandemic on us as creatives which to me is twofold one is the return to what I would call um, our core values right as we kind of our lives recoil on themselves we are forced to uh, pay attention to the things that really matter to things as basic as food as family neighbors these are all actually very islamic principles but actually when i say islamic i usually also mean universal um and i think that within uh, that return to the simpler values we have the potential for a renewal of a more meaningful society and most societal renewal begins not just at the fringes but it begins with the artists it be begins with the artists who allow us to imagine another way of being in this world and one last point I would urge um, any creatives right now is I think we live in a society that is 
uh, death phobic. Uh, we come from a tradition as Muslims where death is part of life. Um, I once met a, a nurse um, uh, in palliative care who said um, Muslims really know how to die. And I, and I know that might sound really uh, strange to a lot of people, but we have uh, so much in our tradition that teaches us how to deal with the processes we are going through. We are a nation in mourning. We are a nation in mourning and yet we don't talk about it at all because death is taboo, but it isn't taboo for us. And we have ways to communicate about death that allow people to retain hope in life. And I hope and I pray that our community will take some leadership and will have the means to take some leadership to actually communicate another way of um, thinking through and digesting what we're going through, inshallah. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful sentiment. You're absolutely right. I mean, certainly in Britain, we are not good at talking about what is going to happen to all of us. Uh, and, of course, and at this moment in time, we, we, should, we should be looking at it more closely. And we should be using potentially art as a mechanism for mediating our relationship with what comes after we've died. Um, uh, on that rather sombre note, uh, I would like to uh, slightly pick up the tempo a bit to say we are uh, so grateful for the time we've had with our speakers. Um, uh, thank you to all of them. Uh, thank you for you for watching and for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to answer all of your questions. I hope you'll be able to watch the video of this event on uh, possibly a YouTube channel or a Facebook page somewhere linked to the uh, Muslim Arts and Culture Festival. If you go onto the website, there'll be some information about where you can see things. Um, I'm gonna very quickly remind you there are lots of events going on across the next three or four months. Look at the website, book for other things, participate and be part of it. Uh, and it's now my great pleasure just to very quickly thank all our participants. Thank you to Russell for um, being so eloquent, uh, given how much we've said and how quickly we've said it. Uh, thank you to Rabia, to Samir, to Teekster and to Miriam for all your time. And thank you, audiences, for your kind attention. And on that note, I'll say good afternoon to everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank Bye. you so much, everyone. Good Bye. to see you all. Bye. Take care.